ladies and gentlemen, to the University of Science and Philosophy series interviews. I'm your host, Matt Presti. I'm pleased to welcome international broadcaster of Deep Dialogue, David William Gibbons, whose areas include science, philosophy, spirituality, environment, health, and technology. Welcome to the program, David. Matt, it's a great pleasure, great honor to be with you today. Well, I just wanted to cover a few basics uh, to start. For instance, let's uh, begin with your childhood. I know that you grew up around Stonehenge, so for the listeners, why don't you tell us a little bit about that experience? I did indeed. I grew up about a mile from Stonehenge in Wiltshire in England. Spent all my former years running around the barley and wheat fields, reading a lot of literature, uh, learning Greek mythology from my uncle, and uh, learnt over time that my heritage went back a very long time to the West Saxons, who around 600-700 AD uh, were protecting uh, Christianity, protecting monasteries, um, and of course uh, in constant battles with the, the then British. A beautiful part of the world, uh, a world that I was fully immersed in until the age of probably 15 or 16 years old. And funnily enough, returned back there two years ago, back to England after some health issues, having lived in the United States for some 25 years, and now realizing the potential of the energy that I gain from being uh, back at Stonehenge again, a, a son of Stonehenge, and uh, enjoying that immensely, Matt. Thank you for that, David. Into your teen years, I guess you attended the same parochial schools that anyone else would. Of course, Western education being what it is, uh, really a limited experience. But what was it that seeded in your soul that gave you the hunger to seek for something greater, and how did you end up leaving England to go to the United States? Well, it's interesting, uh, Matt. I, from a very early age, from six years old, would uh, roam uh, day and night in the fields around Stonehenge. So, very spiritual, right from the beginning of my life, I suppose combined with a love for literature and, quite frankly, probably seen many things that uh, that most haven't. Um, so that was a, a great beginning, a wonderful family life, very stable, secure. So no trauma whatsoever uh, from my uh, years as a child, which is very rare, I think, so very blessed. And was in private schooling in uh, the capital of Wiltshire, Salisbury, until I was 12 years old. And then a uh, dad, because of arthritis, had to move us all nearer London for a short while. And at that point, I became immersed in what we call a grammar school. But a useless student, uh, never um, encouraged uh, in myself to learn never interested in the learning process, looking back now, uh, didn't enjoy the process. Uh, it was uh, years then in the late 70s when everything was multiple choice, everything was rote learning. It was certainly uh, the beginning, uh, probably in terms of our, our period today, of an educational system that fed an economy. And I soon came to realize in my 20s that all I had wished for was an economy or a world or a culture that fed the individual, fed the collective. And of course, we've had many conversations around this. So very spiritual looking back on this now. This is a widely term use word. Uh, it uh, can mean so many things, can't it? But I love the land. I love the history. Uh, I knew of many uh, 
prior lives. I could understand uh, history very, very well. And this is really why I, I was so taken with uh, Walter Russell's work. In regards to the United States, I moved there in 1990. I was there for about 25 years. Uh, a myriad of things that I was involved in. I had actually graduated in the history of art and photography, uh, uh, initially in the United Kingdom, and took that to the United States. But I soon became involved in the corporate sector, working in Hong Kong and Zhenzhen, China, for five or six years as the COO of a large engineering company. Uh, quite amazing when I look back on it, uh, creative becoming involved in that. But I was successful. And then by 9-11, uh, moved back into the arts. And of course, uh, within weeks following the events of 9-11 at the World Trade Center, uh, created uh, the 14 Days Project. So uh, an amazing journey, amazing ride. I've been blessed to travel all across the world and see and witness many cultures. Thank you, David. And for anyone who hasn't seen the 14 days, I would highly recommend it. Would you care to just expound a little bit on the 14 days and what led you to go on that quest and that journey? I come from Sure. Uh, 14 days was something that I created in the weeks following uh, 9-11. We were actually back in the UK for about a year and like us all, very impacted. I mean, I realized at that time that it was going to completely change our world and started designing, hypothetically, I suppose, in my mind, a project that could combine the strengths of photography and film into a documentary where I would travel first in 2004 across the United States for 14 days, 14 cities and towns with a very large crew. And then the following year in 2005, doing the same in the United Kingdom. Very successful, uh, commercially an absolute disaster. Uh, but then documentaries uh, traditionally are not really a, a commercial vehicle. So today, uh, 10 years later, 14 Days in Great Britain is actually officially being launched uh, first in the UK market. I think we have about 250,000 units going out of the film, and it presents a incredible, um, an incredible piece of history, I suppose. It was very close uh, in the years after 9-11. It uh, is a time capsule, and it really uh, cemented, Matt, my position in the humanities, uh, my position in being able to uh, be out uh, in the streets at all these locations and find that I could talk to anybody and uh, could bring anybody into a venue, could talk to them, could photograph them. And the, the results, I have to say, uh, that could not be created without all the crew members that were with me were absolutely phenomenal and definitely changed my life. Well, you're definitely one of the Best kept secrets in UK broadcasting. Uh, looking f further ahead, when you began your series, that that the Deep Dialogue platform, and I believe it was Brian O'Leary that was your the twenty eight hours worth of interviews that you did with him. Uh, could you expound on that and explain to the audience what Deep Dialogue is and what its purpose is? <laughs> Sure. Uh, deep dialogue is something that I had never considered uh, even back in 2001. Uh, I had been uh, uh, quite a introspective sort of chap, uh, very insular, growing up in the fields around Stonehenge for so many years, and really didn't have too much interaction with people until 14 days. And I can illustrate that uh, by the second day in Boston, in the United States, on the first 14 days, when I was essentially out in the streets photographing people, even though we had uh, amazing photographers uh, in the venues themselves. And within about six hours, my producer approached me and said, I'm taking your camera. 
this crew is just shocked that you can just have the gumption to to approach anybody and uh, ask them how they are, talk to them, uh, engage in that uh, that deeper dialogue, uh, forge that connection. I don't know where that came from, Matt. I still can't explain it, uh, except that it's one of those epiphanies in life. It's what you're meant to do. And took that into uh, where I am today after six or seven years into radio broadcasting, into deep dialogue. One hour, one and a half hour dialogues. They are not for everybody. Uh, we are all uh, in this very complex world chasing our tails, uh, trying to make enough money to, to live. And that means uh, that the audience uh, at times can be very restricted. At other times, it can be uh, very, very substantial. But deep dialogue is about forging a, an energetic connection, as you and I do uh, in our series. It's more about, uh, more about language. It's more about words. It's about uh, the love of respect the understanding of the energetic field, uh, leaving behind the traditional forms of communication through senses and language. And I'm still perfecting it. I'm still amazed by what comes from it, uh, but very proud of it. Um, very proud of it, Matt. And of course, our conversations and many others are indicative of uh, the strength that it can create and the power that it can create in changing everybody's lives. Thank you, David. And as far as series goes, um, I wanted to discuss in particular the work you did with Alan Lee Atkins. And many Russell students, alumni, and friends of the USP may not be familiar, but David has done a wonderful series on the Universal One with his co-partner, Alan Lee Atkins. And I'd just like you to describe that series and, you know, expound a little bit upon it and the work that you did with Alan, how many episodes and you know, just a little bit about the atmosphere surrounding the dialogues with Alan. Uh, indeed. I met Alan Atkins, was introduced to Alan Atkins in 2011, about three months prior to Brian O'Leary's passing. And after a couple of programs shared with Alan, which was going to be the extent of, of that broadcasting, he mentioned Walter Bowman Russell. Knew nothing of that. My, my study in prior years had been more in the traditional areas of literature, Chaucer, Shakespeare, etc., Descartes. And Alan sent me a book. And of course, uh, you had uh, graciously later sent me a copy of the Universal One from the university. It entirely changed my life. It took many months to, to feel it. Uh, Universal One is a, a complex book. It's a beautiful book. But we began with the intention of producing two or three programs, finished up with over 100 hours. And uh, it was a time of not only sharing the knowledge of Walter Berman Russell, but it was also an incredible time of the friendship that was created with Alan Lee Atkins, an amazing man, I must say, with so much incredible wisdom. So those years for me were were quite amazing. And I stumbled through it in a way, Matt, in all honesty, uh, complex to discuss, complex to broadcast, uh, but it became very deep after the first uh, five or six hours. We took a chapter at a time and it took us some 18 months to complete. And it was a game changer. It did completely change my whole outlook on life. Uh, on the universe, uh, something that I had not found by studying Carl Sagan or others, uh, found that Walter Berman Russell really was uh, a great illuminate. And with your work with Alan, you have also began a new series on atomic suicide. Would you like to talk to that just briefly? 
Sure, atomic suicide. Uh, I forget now, Matt, whether it was yourself or, or Alan that sent this book. I received the book in 2012. And I was in a, a, a period of uh, quite some grief. Um, and of course, the beginning of the following year, I um, found myself having heart failure, uh, for which I returned back to the United Kingdom and have not left. But the book went with me everywhere. It was in my hand uh, before and after my open heart surgery in London at the London Chest Hospital. It has never left me. And it's an incredible book. It's very diverse. Uh, although one would consider, well, it's atomic suicide, it's obviously talking about the nuclear industry. And yes, it is. But it's something that Walter and Lau created uh, that is very powerful, not only for when it was written, but powerful for the days that we're in now. It doesn't just talk about to the nuclear uh, world. It talks about all of the concepts that are created and discussed in Universal One and in prior books that Walter Russell had written. It is a book that has the most amazing statements and a book that features a feminine side, which is where Lau, I think, was a big secret with this book. Uh, an amazing compliment uh, that took Russell to a, a different level with his work, even though it was later in his life. We're about uh, a third of the way through that series, and it is it is an incredible series. Certainly, when one discovers divine writings and encounters them, it does have a life-changing effect. Having mentioned that you had studied Shakespeare and Descartes, how would you rate Walter Russell's writings in terms of the profound effects on your personal life? Well, Descartes was uh, the famous I am, wasn't he? Uh, Shakespeare was both humor and drama. Um, I could reel them off. Chaucer was more a historical accounts of, of England uh, a very long time ago. Walter Russell is more definitive, it's more sure. Uh, it's created by an individual who is secure in his mind. Uh, that is not something that you would have with earlier philosophers, whether it's Descartes or, or many of the, the names that came before. Walter Russell for me was uh, indicative of a human being who had clearly seen something that nobody ever had. I would rank him uh, highly uh, when I write talk about uh, Jesus, Buddha, uh, Muhammad, Zarasta. I would add to that now, some six or seven years later, Walter Bowman Russell, for his not only his divine writings, but for the way that he comes over as being so secure in the message. I think that was a game changer as well for me. It enabled me to to broadcast and to spread that with so much ease because I felt that I was working with somebody who knew the truth, who had the stability, who had no fears. And I think that that is certainly in my world, looking back at the many individuals that I've covered, very rare, a very rare quality, Matt. Thanks for that, David. Well, discussing the series, The Message of the Divine Iliad, which you and I are into, I believe, our 33rd episode, and of course, which are based on the two volumes written by Walter Russell. May I have your thoughts on the impact that these volumes have had on your life? Well, The Divine Iliad, Matt, of course, came from yourself, and it was uh, an elevation for me from the Universal One. I remember that we had a conversation once a couple of years ago and you had uh, indicated to me, rightly so, that there was a, a definitive difference between these two books simply because of the distance between uh, the times in which they had been written. The Universal One 1926 had a scientific aspect to it 
as well as a universal spiritual aspect. But by the time we reach the Divine Iliad, uh, it's covering all of it. And it is very universal. It is not only uh, a wonderful uh, uh, array of writings of prose, uh, but it's also something, I think, that reflects perhaps a different Walter Russell. Uh, we all evolve, don't we? i constantly being told by people that I have evolved in the last seven years with this programming. And I see that with Walter Russell, but as we travel through the book, which has been life-changing for me, you you do realize the importance of desire. You realize the importance of stillness and rest. And I had always loved the little books that came out at the turn of the century, 1916, 1917, spiritual books, talking to the I Am. And then I found myself with this book that I had found something completely different. It was almost as if it was taking me into a different chapter in life. Uh, just the way that we have been working together, talking about this together, is very special. It has illustrated to me a lot of the experiences that I had gained with Brian O'Leary back in 2011, where Brian could literally remotely contact me uh, without even being next to me or on any sort of communication device. And I I feel this as we progress through our series with this book. It's, uh, it's a book that we talk about uh, sharing our energy and not necessarily sharing a language or a spoken word. And there's something very, very magical about that that still is uh, evolving, I believe. Thanks, David. Yeah, I do enjoy the dialogues that we have together. They are deeply fulfilling in many ways. Um, it's just not every day you get to have such intensive and deep conversation on such a meaningful level. And I recommend uh, to all the listeners out there that you take a, a look at David's work, and we'll give the websites at the end of this broadcast. Um, briefly, David, I wanted to ask you about your Universal One platform and how you see it as a model for moving the communication and dialogues of humanity forward. Well, the Universal One platform is something that I've been planning for three or four years, loosely, I may say. Until 2013, I had returned back to the United Kingdom, uh, traveled through uh, heart failure and many, many operations and procedures, and met Lady Fiona Montague, a Bewley uh, aristocracy in the United Kingdom in southern England, who offered to be co-founder of an organization which, uh, frankly, I wasn't completely sure of its remit. But now I understand it better as both a, a broadcasting mechanism, but also an educational uh, part behind it that feeds that broadcasting uh, vehicle. It's more about, for me, creating a vehicle where anybody and everybody, whatever their worldview, wherever they reside in the world, whatever their culture is, can participate in without complications, without the complexity of uh, a corporate arena or even uh, a religious domain, uh, something that is uh, an open communication where people can simply give their story. Uh, and I think the world is moving in that direction. We're certainly in a, a very uh, complex time in our evolution today, a very dangerous time, I would say. But I see media in the future as not being owned by anybody, not being sponsored as the main networks are, having no agendas, um, having no real bosses behind this to create it as some sort of financial vehicle, but something that is truly supported and run by people all over the world as a form of connection. And I, I do believe that it's... Uh, Another step from what we have today in terms of social media, which I think has its complications. It's all part of evolution. It's all perfect. 
But Universal One is really a vehicle, Matt, that allows anybody to be uh, their own chorus uh, in life today. That's well said, David. And of course, media is defined as a form of conveyance, cultivation, or expression. So in terms of the Universal One platform, would you please describe further in detail, is it an online school? Is it going to be local? What are the things that it's going to focus on as far as helping people to develop a voice to communicate in the modern day language of electronics and whatnot? And what is the emphasis that will be placed on learning to communicate on such a platform as this? Indeed, uh, with the uh, uh, appendum that I think for any education, it is good for people to be together as much as possible. I'm not convinced about the internet and the more I travel, the more I work. And perhaps it's my age because I become... Um, oh, I have a greater tendency today than ever before to try and distance myself from computers and the internet. So I see Universal One and the educational fulfillment as being something that draws people together uh, wherever they are around a table, uh, rather than being some sort of distance learning model, which of course there is nothing wrong with that. But I think it's more about people being together. Uh, The old Latin word for education that talks about pulling education, pulling people or pulling their their thoughts and their ideas and their potential out of them, rather than pumping them with information, which, as I said at the beginning of the program, just acts as a, a feeder for uh, a very corrupt economy, a very corrupt world. So Universal One really, I hope, will be uh, a constant uh, um, year-round model with workshops that uh, brings people together in all types of advocacies, whether it's health, uh, farming, uh, even politics. Uh, Because I do believe that in the future, whether we like it or not, Uh, The consciousness that we talk to, uh, the work that we talk to, the work that Russell talked to, will have to be developed in some way at a higher level. And politics is, I would submit, the only way to do that because of its reach. Very different from the politics we have today, of course, which is completely dysfunctional. So Universal One really is a forum a place where people can love and learn, uh, be with each other, uh, share their memories, share their history, share their culture around a table that then becomes uh, an automatic and natural uh, progression towards broadcasting their voice and their stories. Thank you, David, for that. I'd like to ask you, what is the most profound or the greatest lesson that you've taken away from the work of the Russells? I think it has to be balance. Uh, In my work over these past years, looked at uh, so many different ideas, so many different concepts. And of course, as you know, I work at the moment with Richard Barrett on the levels of consciousness. Uh, So we could talk about Maslow, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that the message that comes from Walter Russell is a unique message of the natural flow of balance. And of course, we know that this is made up of a female-male reunion, uh, because I think it is a reunion today, because as we have agreed in the past, it's been a very male-dominated world for thousands of years. But if anything... If I'm talking about uh, human relations, which is now the principal part of my work, I look at the way that we interact with each other, uh, our capability of response over the emotion of reaction. And this is where Russell was so accurate. He talked about balance. He talked about the the rhythmic interchange uh, it, to such a depth uh, that it takes you beyond the senses that we have been so used to 
uh, in our lives and for many, many lives going back to an understanding that it's not about this world. It's about the real world. And I think the real world is the world that Russell knew of. He had traveled to in his 39 days. And for me, that is the ultimate uh, uh, benefit that has come into my life. Because when you learn all of that, you learn the true art of balance. Thank you, David. Would you like to discuss any upcoming events or anything on the horizon that you'd like to let our listeners know about? Well, we are working on Universal One today, uh, still evolving, and hoping that the uh, Universal One first launch will be this year, or if it's not this year, it will certainly be next year. We have some sizable endorsement parties who have come in, and of course that always shifts the timelines. So Universal One is a a very important um, part of my work today. The broadcasting continues. Uh, It is not as regular or as intense as it used to be because I have over the last two years since going through uh, the heart failure and uh, recovering from that, realize more and more that it's about the the quality of the dialogues and not necessarily the volume. So they're both equally important, but I believe that Universal One, wherever you are in the world, you, you don't have to be in England to feel or experience that, will be the next uh, major event on the horizon, which really is the preface to its official launch in 2020 when not only will you have the educational model in place, but you'll also have a, a system, a technology that allows people to submit, to participate, to be uh, involved uh, in the actual broadcasting itself. So really we're in the early days, but then again, uh, four years does pass by very quickly. So we're eager to keep that momentum going. Indeed. Thank you. And I'd like you to, for our listeners, please give your contact information and your website so anyone out there who would like to look more into your work will be able to do so. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Uh, The official website is davidgibbons.org. For international panels, we also have crossingoverthebridge.com, where I bring panelists together, uh, talking to all types of uh, advocacies that are taking place across the world. Universal One is uh, universalone.tv. It's an important site. And of course, as you know, we have several websites dedicated to the work of Walter Russell as well, which can be found by visiting those sites. But anybody trying to contact us, if you contact us through the information email, which is info at davidgibbons.org, you will certainly get a response within some 72 hours. Thank you, David. And on behalf of the University of Science and Philosophy, I want to thank you for joining us today. I've always enjoyed your friendship and your camaraderie that we share in our deep discussions and dialogues, and I hope that more and more people will come to find that the platform of deep dialogue is certainly a way to move forward in this world. So again, I thank you for coming on. Matt, it's uh, it's a great pleasure, and it's uh, it's a great honor, and uh, certainly celebrate the work that you have taken up at the university. It is terrifically important, and uh, your, your role and your contribution is very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's interview with David William Gibbons. You can check out all his material through the links that are made available throughout this video and also in the more info section underneath the video. We appreciate you taking the time to check us out, spread the word to friends and family about the works and teachings of Dr. Walter and La Russell. And be sure to check out the website, philosophy.org. That's philosophy.org. Call us at 1-800-882-LOVE. That's 1-800-882-LOVE-5683. And again, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for helping to spread these teachings. My name is Matt Presti, and I will see you on the other side of the wave.